Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. We'd like to introduce John Hansen, W2FS, longtime friend and foe. What? <laughs> what? He, John's real good because he, he uh, is an advocate and also a very good conscience. Keeps us on our toes. You don't remember that, John? No. Okay, he's, okay. We love you, John. All right. I'd like to introduce John Hansen, W2FS, Practical Implementations of Bluetooth and Microcontroller Circuits. Uh, thank you, Steve. My name is John Hansen, and a couple of um, observations before we get started today. Um, number one, um, I produce a product called TNCX, among other things, uh, which is a KISS mode TNC that was designed originally well, as a project to teach me something, um, but uh, was designed to be uh, flexible and expandable, and I'm always looking for new uses for it and also new things I can put in it. Uh, Coastal Chipworks is a tiny company. You're pretty much looking at it. Uh, there, there, there are a number of these in, uh, in the amateur radio community today, and either directly or indirectly, an awful lot of them have been spawned by Tapper. And uh, on behalf of all of us who are trying to put our kids through college, I'd like to thank Steve and Tapper for doing that. Um, second thing is, this is the first time, well, no, I should say this, I don't use PowerPoint. I hate it. However, as you can tell, this is PowerPoint. It's the first time I've ever used it, and I'm only using it to show some pictures, but um, if it turns out I don't know what I'm doing with it, we'll find that out soon enough. Uh, my goal when I started this project was to introduce Bluetooth to uh, microcontroller circuits, in particular to TNCX. And so I started with a question that I'm sure everybody has when you start working with Bluetooth, which is, why do they call this Bluetooth? And this is the reason why. Uh, this is Harold Bluetooth Gormison. Um, who was uh, king of Denmark in 953, and uh, Bluetooth is actually named after this man. He's the son of Gorm the Old, and uh, he's most famous for having united the warring factions in Scandinavia. Now, okay, so his nickname was Bluetooth. Why was his nickname Bluetooth? It was a gum disease. And honestly, that's where, that's where Bluetooth, the name, came from. Now, Bluetooth, of course, is a means of providing connectivity, mostly between uh, peripherals and computing devices, and is more and more displacing USB and, before that, serial ports, particularly in mobile devices. And uh, so there's been a lot of interest lately in doing uh, amateur radio applications, in particular APRS on mobile devices. Uh, people speculate that in 10 or 15 years the laptops will all be gone and we'll be using mobile devices exclusively. Um, so it seemed like the logical thing to do was to begin to research doing this with um, uh, doing APRS with Bluetooth. Uh, it is, this is not the first time that people have tried to use handheld mobile devices with APRS. Uh, if we go back 10 or 15 years, there was a guy named Mike Music who had out something called Pocket APRS that was designed to connect Palm, Palm Pilot, back in the days of Palm Pilot devices, uh, to TNCs through its serial port. Um, there was something called WinCE, um, that was put out by Rick Widner. Uh, as near as I, these were back in the 
1990s. As near as I can tell, both of these programs are pretty much dead, mostly because the devices that they were designed to support have gone away. Um, in some way, it's probably just as well that everything is moving toward Bluetooth because for ham radio operators in particular, USB caused uh, several problems. Um, one of them was that USB comes in two flavors, master and slave, except in uh, Los Angeles County, we're using those terms as illegal. Um, I'm not making this up. Uh, <laughs> And the, the idea is that a master USB device controls the bus and then slave devices hang on it, but you can't connect two slave devices together, at least not easily. And so, for example, people keep asking, uh, how do I connect my USB GPS to, well, maybe TNCX, maybe a tiny track, uh, any of the devices that we currently use these days? And the answer is you don't. Um, because to the extent that TNCX in particular supports USB, it was designed to connect to a computer. The computer is a master device. Uh, TNCX is, has a, a USB slave in it. Um, and so a, a GPS was also designed to connect to a PC, so it has a USB slave in it. So we have a problem connecting the two slaves together. Um, as far as I know, there aren't any TNCs that will support a connection to uh, a USB GPS. Bluetooth gets around that. And you may notice that the same uh, pair of headphones, Bluetooth headphones, that you can connect to your phone, um, you can also connect to your computer. And yet your phone is designed to connect to your computer as well. Um, so. Bluetooth solves that problem. The other problem that Bluetooth helps get around is every time you connect a new USB device to your computer, you generally have to load a driver unless it's already there. Um, Bluetooth doesn't have drivers. Uh, you have to pair the device, but you don't have to worry about loading a, a device-specific driver. Um, every time you want to use a new Bluetooth device. So really, there are some, some real advantages to this um, if only we can figure out how to do it. So in part, my goal here is to uh, connect Bluetooth uh, to microcontroller devices, but in, in particular, it's to connect uh, Bluetooth to TNCX. Uh, this is a TNCX, and this, there's an expansion header in TNCX. TNCX was designed from the ground up to be expandable, and it contains an expansion header that currently has three daughter boards available for it, which can provide either tracking services or digipeter services. This would plug in as yet another daughter board when it's, obviously it's not done yet. Um, but, but that's ultimately what it's designed to do. Um, now, in order to do this, uh, of course, you need a Bluetooth device to plug in, and one of the most common ones that's available today is by a company called Roving Networks. They make two Bluetooth radios, uh, RN41 and RN42, and this is the Bluetooth radio. It's on another board, which is on another board, which is on another board, but this part is the Bluetooth radio. Here's the antenna. And they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, they make two types, as I said. There is a, a lower power one, the RN42, which puts out about three milliwatts. And there's a higher power one, the RN41, which puts out more like 32 milliwatts. Um, the problem with them in terms of just using them from the standpoint of an amateur radio experimenter is that physically they're somewhat difficult to deal with in that they not only are they surface mount devices, but some of the surface mount connections are actually underneath the radio module. So that usual soldering techniques of a solder, even surface mount soldering techniques of a soldering iron aren't going to work here. Um, I welcome your comments on whether I should go down and buy the, um, the electric frying pan or the toaster oven for doing this, I'm, 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 
I've got the module, I've had some circuit boards made. At some point, um, I'm going to need to learn how to do that, but I haven't gotten that far yet. However, if you're willing to pay somewhat more money, there are now modules available that have the radios pre-mounted on them. Um, the one that I'm using looks like this in close-up. This is put out by SparkFun. Um, if you're not familiar with SparkFun, the company, www.sparkfun.com, you really ought to every now and then go take a look at them because they're, they constantly come out with new things that uh, are very often just parts that they make more uh, easier for uh, those of us who are experimenters to use. Uh, often they're not particularly cheap, but particularly if you're looking into prototyping, uh, they work quite well. This is a, a SparkFun board, whoops, a SparkFun board uh, with the radio module mounted on it. This is the uh, higher power ones, the higher power one. Um, and uh, unfortunately, SparkFun sells these for about $60. So while the radios, the lower power one is about $18 and the higher power one is $25, uh, they're making a, a tidy profit on these uh, boards that really don't do a whole lot other than serve as a carrier for, these, uh, for the modules. Now more recently, Roving Networks itself has begun to put out uh, modules that have the radios mounted on them and the price of those is significantly cheaper. The lower power one, quantity one, is $39 and the higher power one is $45. But again, that's still quite a premium that you're paying over the cost of the radio themselves. Um, interfacing these to microcontroller circuits is relatively easy. If, you're, if your circuit is, runs at 3.3 volts, you can pretty much connect it directly, and everything you really need to know about it is down here. Uh, you need to connect 3.3 volts here, ground here, and receive data and transmit data. And the data that is coming and going from this is standard asynchronous serial data. Uh, the default baud rate is 115K, uh, but you can adjust that. To, TNCX won't do 115K on the terminal link but you can adjust that uh, downward. Uh, and in, in, in my case, I've adjusted it down to 9600 baud and uh, it communicates uh, very, very well. The problem that you run into, you may run into, is if you're trying to interface it to a five volt circuit. Uh, five volts will kill it. Not just five volts applied here, but five volts applied here as well will kill it. And so on the module that that I had here, uh, you can see that there's a voltage regulator uh, there as well. That's way overkill, by the way. That's a 3.3 volt voltage regulator, and I used that one because I had it. Um, this thing only draws about 100 MA, so you can, you can actually uh, use a, a substantially smaller, cheaper, lower power voltage regulator with it without a problem. Um, there are um, circuits available from uh, roving networks that are reproduced in the paper for conditioning the power that comes into the RX line so it doesn't blow it up, essentially a simple voltage divider circuit. Um, and that's really what is on the module that's inside TNCX, is uh, a voltage regulator, a couple of capacitors, and a voltage divider circuit for the um, um, data line that's going into uh, the roving networks unit. Uh, it's relatively simple to interface this with the TNCX. The TNCX has an 8-pin header in it. Uh, normally the, the data is routed back into the TNCX by jumpering um, pins 1 and 2 and jumpering pins 3 and 4. Pins 5 and 6 provide access to a second serial port, and it provides power and ground. The idea here was to make it easy to develop daughter boards that could be, uh, could be plugged in here. Um, so there's, there's not that much to interfacing it to TNCX or, again, your own microcontroller circuit. Um, now, the uh, roving networks modules are highly configurable, not just baud rate, but a whole bunch of other parameters as well. 
Some of the more common commands are listed in my paper. They're not, this, they're not the old Hayes AT command set. They're a completely new and proprietary set of commands, uh, but they're documented in um, Roving Network's user manual. To um, communicate with the Roving Network's module and to configure it, you basically need a terminal program. Um, so you're going to be using probably a PC to configure it, and then you'll take it and put it in your circuit. Um, it is standard RS-232 data that you use to configure it, but you can't connect it directly to a PC either because, again, it's 3.3 volts TTL signals rather than RS-232 signals. So if you use, um, say, a MAX-3232 chip, that's like a MAX-232 chip only is designed to run at 3.3 volts, uh, it'll work quite nicely. You uh, hit the, uh, within a minute of turning it on, you hit the uh, dollar sign three times and a command prompt comes up. And then it's relatively simple to uh, issue commands to the thing. Now you may have noticed that uh, Bluetooth is used for a whole lot of things these days that are fundamentally different kinds of activities. Um, it can be used to control your mobile phone in your car, not just to transfer audio, but to initiate phone calls as well. It could be used to access the address book on your mobile phone. Uh, it runs uh, wireless headphones and wireless speakers. It's used for wireless keyboards and wireless mice. And these functions really are, are, I mean, they all transfer data, but they're somewhat different. And you might have wondered how it's doing all this without a driver. And the answer is that Bluetooth was designed with pre-written profiles, um, which describe a particular application and how you interface with it to achieve that application. So for example, there is an application that is a mobile phone profile. Um, now, the profile that we're interested in, if you're going to interface this to asynchronous serial data on a microcontroller, is something called the serial port profile. So if you're out looking at candidate Bluetooth devices to buy to connect to uh, an amateur radio project, you have to be careful as to what profiles they support because you can't count on them, any one of these, supporting all of the profiles or even a majority of them. And in fact, the roving network's uh, interface supports two profiles. Fortunately, one of them is the serial port profile that we need for this project, and the other one is the dial-up networking project, which or dial-up networking profile, which we don't need for this project. But it's important to look for one that does that. I must say, I'm, I, this, this roving network's radio seems to be coming seems to be used very, very widely these days in the same way that the uh, FTDI chips were used very widely for interfacing on, on USB. So you may well find them in um, a number of products made by, uh, by other companies. All right, now in terms of connecting my TNCX to a phone, I'm just, I'm just I have an Android uh, X, Droid X, and that was the uh, target platform uh, that I had in mind for this project. Um, I have not gotten very far with Android programming yet, but I was originally scheduled to teach it next semester, so I assume I'm going to learn something in the next few months, um, assuming, the course goes, <laughs> assuming the course goes forward. Uh, I, I've been told that it's relatively easy for Java programmers to get up and running on this, so it, it shouldn't, I don't think it should be um, that big a problem. Uh, the first thing that you have to do, um, well, is to pair the device with the phone that you're using. Um, and I started with a simple terminal program running on the phone because I, I did not want to worry about whether or not the APRS portion of this was working or not. And I found a piece of software called Terminal BT, standing for Bluetooth, um, and, and ran that on my machine. I pushed the appropriate buttons, and it found the, uh, the Bluetooth device that I was connecting it to, and, um, and off I went. I was able to transmit data from TNCX, which of course is KISS formatted, 
are, are KISS encapsulated AX.25 packets, so a lot of it looks like garbage characters, but the fact that I recognized the garbage characters from uh, earlier tests with computers led me to believe that indeed it was working properly. Now there is an APRS, pro, at least one APRS program for uh, Android. It's called APRS Droid, and it was written by George Lucas. I assume that was after he did Star Wars. <laughs> um, he's, uh, his call sign is DO1GL, and it, no, it's not the same George Lucas. Um, this program has been in development for a while, and when I started working with this, I contacted George and um, worked with him to make sure that this thing would work on KISS mode properly. I must say he's, he's, he's very quick to pick this stuff up. The first draft of the uh, KISS interface worked really, really well. Uh, and so it does indeed support that. So let me show you a couple of screenshots from that program. The first thing you have to do is to select the Bluetooth device that you want to connect with. And um, you'll notice this comes up as TNCX. Again, that's because the roving, mod or the roving network modules are highly configurable. And among other things, you can configure what they're going to come up as on computers and, and uh, handheld devices and the like. So I saw that, I thought that worked, out, uh, that worked out very well. So you pick TNCX off the list and you have it start tracking and you can see that we're actually receiving uh, APRS packets here. Uh, uh, APRS Droid also interfaces with the mapping module uh, that's, within, that's within Android. The cool thing about this is you don't have to, you don't have to do much programming to get that going. Um, so uh, uh, George didn't actually write this. He just interfaced with the, uh, with the mapping module that was already with, within Android. So uh, this turned out to be uh, turned out to be uh, quite good and, and, and worked very well the first time out of the box. Now, in addition to connecting to my phone, um, another thing I wanted to try was connecting to my PC. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people that want to connect um, a TNCX to their PC using Bluetooth simply because if you do it using USB, it powers the TNC as well. And of course, you're not going to be able to power it using Bluetooth. Uh, but I, I tried that with my laptop, and it did work as well. Um, and so I think this will work as a, uh, as a general method of providing Bluetooth co connectivity to, um, to, uh, to uh, TNCX and other devices like that. Um, I plan to start producing a Bluetooth module for TNCX within the next couple of months. I still haven't decided yet what power level I'm going to use. I started initially with the higher power Bluetooth modules, um, and the reason that I did that was uh, TNCX is in a steel box. And I never envisioned that I'd be putting Bluetooth on it when I designed the thing, and so the antenna does not stick out the back of the box, which would have been the way to do this, to put a slot in the box to do that. Uh, but I found that it's sufficiently leaky that, um, that I can connect to it with a higher power module. I suspect that it's going to work with a lower power module as well, but um, I haven't tried that yet. Uh, I have found that I can walk a fair amount of way, ways away from the radio, from the uh, TNC, and, uh, and still maintain connectivity. So it, it does seem to be working well. Um, the other thing I haven't decided was whether or not I'm going to use the radio itself or whether I'm going to use these modules. I pretty much decided at the time uh, that I looked at the $60 modules that $60 was way too much money uh, for this, that uh, you just couldn't sell that. So uh, the lower price modules may provide the answer. By the way, Roving Network's own modules, if you use those, also have a 3.3-volt uh, regulator on them. So it will, you can put 5 volts in them. You still have to use the voltage divider circuit when you connect the data to them, but it does make it substantially uh, simpler. Okay, well thank you for your time today. Um, I had planned to do a demo, but unfortunately the cable didn't arrive, so we're going <laughs> to pass on that. Uh, I'll be happy to take any uh, uh, questions.
questions or listen to any comments you might have. Outside of your uh, uh, TNCX, uh, have you uh, had any other thoughts about Bluetooth and other applications? Well, the thing about it is, is it's, just, it's just asynchronous serial data so that anything that you, you have that you can be interfaced to through asynchronous serial data, you can use for this. Um, I, can, I, can, I can envision, um, I, mean, I had another project here a couple of years ago that was a virtual serial cable that provided um, serial data connectivity services without wires. I can imagine doing that though the range wouldn't be what it is with the current modules. Um, but really, anything that you've got that does asynchronous serial data, this will, this will do it. It shows up on a computer when, when you connect it that way. It shows up as a COM port, standard COM port, um, assuming it supports the serial port profile. So it's pretty simple to write piece of software on the PC side, too. Is that Google Maps that uh, you're using for the uh, mapping? Uh? Yeah, the, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what this is. This is because it's built into Android. Um, it's really nice that those services are exposed to any application that needs to use them so that all of a sudden you've got something that looks relatively sophisticated without your having to do any of the mapping software at all. Uh, where's the best place to get a uh, TNCX from? And is that your website, Coastal? Uh, is that Coastal it? Chipworks? Yeah. Yeah, go to www.tnc-x.com. I guess that's the commercial. I just had a general uh, Bluetooth question. If both, essentially, they're both Bluetooth devices. They're sort of peers. Which Does someone initiate the pairing, or does someone have to take over the... Yes, yes. Uh, and you can configure whether the Bluetooth module the Roving Network's Bluetooth module is the one that's going to do that or whether the other one is going to do that. But somebody does initiate the connection. Is there a name for that function? Or yes, and I've forgotten what it is. Uh, real quick, I've, I've been talking to George Lucas uh, throughout, the, throughout a bunch of this process. And um, he's got a new version. First of all, he'd like you to know that APRS Droid is available for free off of his website. You can sideload it into your Android phone or you can just buy it for $4.99 or $4.95 off, uh, off the Android market, and everything he gets off that goes right back into the development. He buys more Android devices to do APRS Droid on. Uh, one of the things he's just added is the ability to use uh, open streets ma street maps, preloaded maps. So if you don't have internet connectivity, you can still use the mapping function of APRS Droid. Um, you can, he's got a bunch of European maps that are pre-made. I'm going to assist him making uh, state level US maps. So you can load those into your Droid phone and then you can, they'll be available for doing APRS when you don't have an internet connection, emergency situations, or you're out of, if you have a tablet that doesn't have 3G or whatever like that. Um, so that'll be available too. But, but George did ask me if I could just do a quick pitch on APRS. Thank Droid, you. So. George, Thanks. George, George, <laughs> that's a long way for George. Okay. Uh, I, I really do appreciate that. There was something else about that. John? Go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, Jason, back here. Uh, more of a comment. Um, you'd mentioned about using it in the home. I built up something kind of similar, you know, you and I were talking about. I like it for the fact that I can walk around anywhere in my house with my laptop, leave my radio and TNC connected up in another room, and I can run APRS from anywhere in the house, you know, either from my phone or my laptop or anything. So the higher power module inside the house is nice for that. I'm just trying to find a more centrally located position so I get a good strong signal throughout the house. That, I think that's a good point. Um, when I look back at the maps that, that were used with pocket APRS back in the day, they look so primitive compared with, with what's on the screen here. It's just amazing how far we've come in that area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John.